Well, hi, everybody. This is God's Heart for the Sad Truth. Some of you may remember my speaking about the difference between proximate and ultimate explanations in science. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with those two terms, let me briefly summarize them for you. So proximate explanations is where much of science operates. It explains the how and what of a phenomenon. Uh, most Nobel Prizes that have ever been won have been won at the proximate level. The ultimate uh, explanation for a given phenomenon involving a biological organism is to understand the Darwinian why. So while the proximate causes tackle the how and what, the ultimate explanation seeks to understand why would the particular trait or behavior have evolved to be of that form. And so it's not that ultimate is a superior explanation to proximate, it's that you need both epistemological levels of a scientific explanation to fully understand a phenomenon. And it is something that uh, I've tried to explain and certainly introduce within uh, my areas of consumer psychology and decision making and so on. Uh, much of the work in those fields are at the proximate level, and that's great. It allows us to uncover all sorts of how and what phenomena, but ultimately we have to understand why uh, consumers would have evolved to prefer fatty foods, or why is it that men are more likely to uh, consume pornography from an evolutionary perspective. And so again, you know, it's important that even if someone is not going to be an evolutionary scientist, that they understand the difference between these two levels of explanations. So today what I thought I would do is demonstrate to you how a, an evolutionary lens allows us to ask questions about, uh, you know, one of the important uh, fundamentals of what makes us who we are, and that is basically our memory, right? Uh, I mean, each of us is a, uh, is a, our personhood is in part the, co the collective memories that we have acquired through our lives. And so understanding how memory works is certainly a, a important scientific goal. Now, as you might imagine, much of memory research as conducted by cognitive psychologists has been at the proximate level. So an example of a proximate effect. Um, if you give people a list, they are much more likely to remember the items that are uh, early in the list or last on the list. The stuff that's sort of lost in the middle it takes longer for people to retain that. And that's a, uh, it's a type of, uh, it's a serial positioning effect, if you like, or uh, repetition effects uh, uh, have an inverted U shape. If you repeat something enough times, you know, people then uh, prefer it, uh, they learn more from it, uh, but, but up to a certain point, and then there might be uh, reactance. And so the number of times that you repeat a message doesn't only serve to increase your liking of that particular message, uh, but rather it follows an inverted U shape. So there are all sorts of uh, proximate phenomena that cognitive scientists have uncovered regarding memory, but then the ultimate explanation would be to ask, you know, why has our memory evolved to have the particular biases that it has. And by bias here, we don't mean it in a negative sense. I mean, why is it that I'm more likely to remember certain things more than others? Is there an evolutionary reason that would have resulted uh, in my uh, exhibiting that particular uh, memory bias? Now think of other animals. So if you just look out your garden, you'll see squirrels. And certainly if you live in a place that is uh, defined by long winters, they are incredibly adept at, uh, you know, having all sorts of food caches all over the place where they hide foods and they can't go back and get them uh, via their senses. It's not as though they smell the nut. It's that they actually have a, a if you like, a, a memory of all of the places where they might have cached their food. Uh, there are all sorts of animals that exhi exhibit, uh, you know, a, a breathtaking array of memory feats that are very much driven by the evolutionary history of that particular species. So then, as I said, the question is to ask the, to, to pose the following. Why is our memory structured? Uh, why does it function in the way that it does from an evolutionary sense? And so what I thought I would share with you today is some findings that I uh, uncovered. These are not from my own studies. This is actually part of a paper that I'm currently working on. Uh, 
uh, whereby, you know, I'm talking about uh, this idea of nomological networks of cumulative evidence. Some of you may have seen uh, my uh, lectures on this topic. And actually, in a recent paper of mine in the journal Marketing Research, I discuss uh, the epistemology of, of evolutionary psychology. And I talk about how uh, evolutionary psychology in particular and evolutionary theory in general uh, is very good at building these nomological networks of cumulative evidence, which basically means to uh, to cull together uh, evidence ranging from a broad range of uh, fields, paradigms, time periods, cultures, disciplines, uh, that then offers you a, if you like, a tsunami of evidence that, that becomes unassailable to argue against. And that's precisely what Darwin had done in his uh, on origin, uh, on uh, the origins of species, uh, which, by the way, I should, uh, uh, you know, give him a shout out since yesterday was Darwin Day. So, uh, how would we apply this nomological networks idea to adaptive memory? So let's go through some examples to to show you how we might be able to begin to construct such a network of evidence that demonstrates that our memory didn't come out of nowhere. It didn't magically appear, but rather it is a product of the same evolutionary forces that explains everything else in life. Uh, so here we go. Uh, I won't read for you. Uh, I won't cite the specific references uh, because then it might make it uh, cumbersome to do so. But eventually, if I hope this paper gets published, you'll be able to see all of the relevant citations. So cheaters' faces and names are more likely to be recalled. So, for example, if I give you a bunch of images of people and I simply tag them as, you know, cheaters or not. Uh, cheaters could be, for example, that they cheated on a social contract. Uh, you engage in a reciprocal arrangement. You know, I, I scratch your back and you scratch mine. But then the person in question ended up uh, reneging his obligations. So in that sense, he's a cheater in a social contract. So simply by tagging people as cheats or not, holding everything else constant, so it's not as though the cheaters were also gorgeous people and the non-cheaters were ugly people, right? This wouldn't be a good experiment. So people were much more likely to recall uh, faces of people who were tagged as cheaters. Now, again, it doesn't take much of an evolutionary scientist to understand why our memory would be structured that way. It makes evolutionary sense to remember, especially if you're going to engage in repeat interactions, to remember those who are not to be trusted and take note of that. Moving on, and what I tried to do when I was uh, finding all of these different studies is to try to look for examples of memory uh, findings that take place across different evolutionary domains. So the first one deals with sociality. The next one deals with uh, food hoarding. So uh, here's the effect. Greater spatial recall of high-calorie foods uh, was exhibited uh, in one study by women and then in another study by both sexes. So again, if you show people a bunch of food locations and then ask them to remember where particular foods were, they are... They have a penchant, if you'd like, a bias to remembering the spatial positions of high-calorie foods. And again, it doesn't take a profound evolutionary uh, scientist to understand why uh, people might be more likely to recall foods uh, that are, you know, the location of foods that are high in calories, not unlike how squirrels remember where they've stored their foods. Adult, this is the next finding. Adolescents uh, exhibit greater recall of survival-related information regarding fruits. So, for example, if you, if I list you a bunch of fruits and I tell you a bunch of attributes about those fruits, whereby some of the attributes are survival-related. You know, it, for example, uh, when the fruit is this color, you shouldn't eat it because it's toxic. Okay. And so you give people a bunch of nuggets of information and then ask them to recall information on the various fruits. They're much more likely to remember stuff that is linked to survival. So again, it's not as though memory is, quote, unbiased in its capacity to learn information. Rather, it exhibits a bias towards remembering things that are inherently more important to an organism's survival. 
Here's another one within the mating domain. Uh, the greater spatial memory recall of beautiful, beautiful women's faces by both sexes. So if I give you an array of faces and then I ask you to remember, uh, you know, where a particular face was, both men and women are much more likely to remember the location of women's faces. Now, men will recall it for a different reason than women. And in the case of men, you know, it makes evolutionary sense that they remember that they have a penchant towards remembering where the beautiful women are located. And f for intrasexual rivalry reasons, uh, women will also have a greater likelihood of remembering uh, the faces of beautiful women. But no such luck when it comes to the beautiful faces of men. Next finding, men's greater likelihood of recalling status products after being primed with a photo of beautiful woman in sexy attire. So if you prime men to put them in a mating mindset, and then you show them a bunch of products, some of which relate to status, which is relevant in the mating market, others that are not related to status, they're much more likely to recall the status products specifically when they are in the mating mindset. And not surprisingly, this effect applies to men uh, more so than it does to women. Uh, next one uh, deals with a uh, woman effect. Women's superior recall of status products when in the ovulatory phase of their menstrual cycles. So here what you're basically arguing is that the likelihood of women remembering products that are relevant to the mating domain is most likely to occur when they are in the uh, fertile phase of their menstrual cycles. And again, this makes perfect evolutionary sense. Now watch all these examples that I just gave you. Some deal with food, others deal with social interactions, other deal with uh, mating domains, uh, but they all exhibit a memory bias that we, uh, that we, uh, we succumb to, if you'd like, uh, maybe succumb to is not the right word, that we exhibit precisely because our memory is not just some domain general instrument. Rather, it has evolved to solve very specific evolutionary problems. And finally, the last set of effects that I'd like to talk about, this is a general effect called the survival processing effect. So information is better recalled when it is associated with a survival scenario. So if I give you a bunch of... Uh, you know, products or items to recall, and I either ask you to recall it in the context of some survival scenario or some non-survival scenario, the exact same set is more likely or a greater number of items will be recalled when I've primed you to be in the survival scenario mindset. In other words, you simply pay more attention, your memory is more engaged when I put you in a survival prime. And it turns out that that prime also has been replicated for children ranging from the age of four to 12 years of age. So I, you know, it was a very, very painstaking effort for me to sort of go through the memory literature and try to say, okay, what are the types of findings that I'd like to come up with across as many domains as possible that begins to highlight the fact that our memory system is not this sort of uh, general mechanism that came out of nowhere, but rather it is very much fine-tuned uh, to solve very specific evolutionary problems. And this speaks exactly to a sad truth clip that I did uh, recently, uh, you know, where I use the uh, famous Swiss Army knife uh, metaphor to explain the architecture of the human mind. The idea being that the human mind is comprised of domain-specific mechanisms meant to solve specific evolutionary problems, very much like how a Swiss army knife is made up of multiple blades. So there you have it, folks. I hope uh, this gives you a good sense of how we use evolutionary theory to understand the structure of uh, the human mind. Hope you're having a good week. I'll talk to you soon. If you enjoyed this uh, uh, clip, please consider sharing it. And uh, as I've uh, often reminded folks, if you appreciate my work and wish to uh, support it, uh, please consider uh, supporting me either through Patreon and or PayPal. Cheers.